Welcome everybody, welcome back to another episode of New Agreements, the very first one in lockdown. And I'm incredibly chuffed to have Andres Arouse. Have I said it right? Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, with me today on the first Zoom episode of New Agreements. Thanks so much for making time. No, thank you, David. I'm happy to join you and to have an important discussion for the world and for all your audience. And you're in lockdown in Mexico City with your family at the moment? Yeah, I'm in Mexico City uh, I'm with my family. We're all healthy uh, so far. Uh, the city, it seems like the situation has been managed correctly. And uh, yeah, but still in lockdown mode. Okay, cool. Well, um, I'll let you introduce yourself in a second, but you have some incredible credentials. I just want to tell everybody who's listening how I found you and how this conversation came about. Um, my housemate last week asked me a very simple question, or seemingly simple anyway. She said, where's all this money coming from after Trump announced a trillion and after the UK government announced 300 billion of subsidies and uh, sort of support for the societies that they operate um, with? And I thought, I've got some answers for you, but not especially good ones. I then found a podcast where a guy mentioned a concept that I had never heard before relating to the International Monetary Fund, a concept called SDRs, which I then followed that, found an article on the Financial Times, which I had to sign up, and go through their paywall in order to access. Um, and the main video content that they were quoting in their article was a panel session at a conference called Decode, of which an hour deep into that talk, I heard you do what I can only describe as a stunning 10 minute presentation where you addressed in really clear terms what SDRs or special drawing rights are. And you went on to talk about what it would mean to decolonize and de dollarize money. And as soon as I heard you saying that, I immediately reached out and hoped that we might be able to have a conversation where we could broaden this out and, and share it with a wider audience. So hopefully we'll get into some of that and anything else that seems relevant um, as we sit in lockdown today in a crazy unprecedented time. But um, a couple of facts I've got about you and then you can tell me if I'm right and, and tell us a bit about your backstory and, and give us some context. But you have a PhD or working on a PhD in international money. Yeah, 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 I'm working exactly on that, yeah. And you were the former Minister of Knowledge in the Ecuadorian government, is that also right? Yes, that's right. That's a, it's a phenomenal title, I love it. Um, <laughs> yes. So why don't you tell us a bit about your background then and, um, and what's led you into these subjects and, and then maybe we can get into some of the content I've referred to. Yeah, so uh, again, thanks for the invitation to be able to, to join you and to talk about these issues, which are very important right now actually uh, but uh, yeah just a little bit about myself perhaps uh, uh, I'm going to go from the present towards the past uh, but right now I'm living in Mexico City I'm working on uh, my uh, PhD in financial economics and within that I'm specializing on international money and uh, capital flows uh, how money moves around from place to place and specifically within that I'm focusing on what you can call the plumbing of the international money system, uh, which in financial parlance uh, you may refer to as the payment system. Uh, and uh, so basically that's, that's my niche and that's what I'm focusing on. Mm -hmm. uh, before that, uh, I was working uh, in the Rafael Correa administration of Ecuador. Mm -hmm. um, in the Ecuadorian government, I was the minister of knowledge which was uh, one of the six uh, supervisory ministries that Correa designed for the whole of government, where he divided, basically divided the entire public sector into six large areas. One which uh, uh, make, we may call the strategic sectors, which included basically natural resources, energy, telecommunications, and so forth. The second one was the production sector, basically industry, agriculture, fishing, and so on. Uh, a third uh, sector, which was the uh, social development sector, which is housing, uh, welfare, uh, health, and, and others. Uh, a fourth sector, which was the security sector, defense, police, etc. The economy, 
uh, sector, which was the uh, Ministry of Finance, the development banks, the central bank, and, and, and so on, the tax administration. And then the last sector that he created, uh, only about three years before he finished his term, uh, was the knowledge sector. Mm -hmm. And the knowledge sector was the newest one uh, of them all, as I said, and it included education, intellectual property, higher education, universities, mm -hmm. research and development, uh, also innovation policy, uh, and uh, culture and heritage policy, and a very important element for the Ecuadorian people, which is what's called ancestral knowledge, mm. or what others may know uh, as sort of uh, uh, traditional knowledge, uh, the indigenous people's knowledge, right? Yes. So that, that, is, that was also incorporated uh, together with uh, biodiversity into this knowledge sector. Uh, which I had the, the privilege and the honor to, to lead. And uh, of course, uh, it, it was a very joyous time because it was all basically new and mm -hmm. for a developing country to have the knowledge uh, sector given such an importance and to have a relatively younger person like I am to direct all of that was definitely uh, something uh, very, very f uh, fulfilling. Uh, but also very important for, for our society and for uh, our economy, which was in the midst of a transition from a research, natural resource intensive economy to try to go into a knowledge intensive. I see. So I was doing that. And before that, I had several responsibilities in the government as well as a vice minister for development planning. Uh, before that, I also worked as general director of the Central Bank of Ecuador. Oh, wow. Uh, and also uh, as an advisor to the Minister of Economy, the Economy Minister uh, in, in the Korean government. So uh, as you can see, I have some experience in the public sector. Uh, I have rel related experience also in the private sector and in the financial world. But uh, this is basically what I've been doing for the last 10 years or so. Wow. Uh, of my life. And, and, and thanks for that. And before we go on, can I just ask some incredibly ignorant questions on, on behalf of myself and, and any of the viewers that are listening? Um, I haven't yet had the privilege of traveling to Ecuador. The closest that I've been is to Brazil a couple of times. Um, and I went on a bit of a pilgrimage myself to Costa Rica to the Corcovado rainforest there. And I ended up starting a project because I was so inspired because it's the most biologically diverse place on the planet or so it, it claims to be. And it was absolutely incredible. For me, it's like going to a Mecca. It's the home of life flourishing in its fullest. And, and uh, I came back and started lots of projects uh, coming from that energy. But um, just a couple of ignorant questions to, to ask. It, it, what is the money of Ecuador called? Well, uh, surprisingly, the money of Ecuador is the US dollar. Uh, Ecuador see. dollarized its economy in the year 2000 after a financial crisis. Mm -hmm. And so far, it's still the currency of Ecuador until today. Okay, I'm sure we'll come on to that then as we begin to discuss yeah. the relationship. Um, but also then, and, and what is the, the language in Ecuador? Is it, is it Spanish? I, I apologize that I don't know. Yeah, in Ecuador, the main language is, is Spanish. About 10% of the population also speaks uh, Quechua, Quechua, which is an a native indigenous uh, language uh, of the Andes. Wow. Uh, but uh, yeah, Spanish is the official language. Okay, understood. Okay, great. Well, thanks for that. I just wanted to make sure we were on the right basis. And um, so you mentioned about the dollarization um, of the currency. And I guess maybe you could uh, lead us into understanding a bit of that and then and do SDRs play a role in that at all? Yeah, well, uh, uh, in Ecuador, the, the currency we, we use, uh, the, the US dollar, uh, has sort of the basic tenet, uh, which uh, means mainly orthodox economists have said that if you use the US dollar as a currency, basically you have no chance of monetary policy. You basically have to adopt everything the US uh, Federal Reserve, which is the US central bank, Mm -hmm. Decides in terms of interest rates, in terms of uh, the the value of the currency with respect to the rest of the world, 
And uh, basically, we can't do much. So basically, the Orthodox economists say we're, we're our, our hands are tied mm -hmm. because we don't have uh, our own currency. So uh, there's nothing much we can do except you know trade and so forth. Mm -hmm. But uh, my job uh, while I was uh, at the central bank was precisely to uh, think in the opposite terms mm -hmm. and to say, okay, given that Ecuador does not have its own uh, currency and we use the US dollar, what, are, um, what is my policy space? What can I do mm -hmm. uh, with that restriction mm -hmm. in order to uh, improve the basically well-being of my citizens and, mm -hmm. and to try to change the structure of our economy to make mm. it a little bit less dependent and so forth. Can, can so, we go back uh, one step though, just to understand why yeah. did it become a dollarized economy? Right, so this is important. In uh, the 90s, uh, Ecuador had what's called the uh, ultra liberalized regime. So basically uh, all of the main uh, uh, controls that we had set in place for the domestic banking system were lifted and banks created tons of offshore uh, structures in, in Caribbean tax havens mm -hmm. and European tax havens. And they basically played uh, around with uh, uh, the depositors' money uh, and they lent the money to uh, related companies, which then didn't pay back the loans. And we had a very important financial crisis at the end of the 90s, which cost about 30% of GDP. Wow. And it led to the expulsion of around uh, 2 million Ecuadorians out of a then population of 12 million. Wow. So about a sixth of the population had to leave the country to the United States, to Spain and to Italy mostly. And uh, to the just find money that was to find a living. To find a living because yeah. the, the economic situation was so dire. Wow. So the, uh, the, the population uh, decided to vote with, the, with their feet. Mm. And uh, of course, that created other types of uh, structural weaknesses to a society in terms of breaking apart family mm -hmm. and, and so on. Suicide rate went up, etc. Mm -hmm. But uh, the government, uh, which was a right wing government at the time, decided to dollarize the economy. Basically, mm -hmm. they said, uh, we can't trust ourselves with having our own currency because we're devaluing it and and. Uh, depreciating it and it's got, we have a process of hyperinflation. Mm -hmm. So we're going to adopt the US dollar as uh, the official currency. Yeah. Now getting into the, the, the dollar as, as, one, as a country's official currency uh, is, is hard, but once it's, the decision is taken, it's even more difficult to come out, out of it. And if right. not, you can just ask, uh, for example, the Greeks as to whether it's, uh, or the Italians as, as to whether it's, simple to leave the euro or not it's yeah. very hard to to take that decision obviously there's a, you know and we probably don't have time for it now you know lots of pros and cons about whether or not that is a helpful mechanism to stabilize the economy but in a specific sense what cultural implication do you think moving from one's own culture to uh, some uh, another country's uh, money on, on simply on a cultural level, uh, the kind of the, 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 the psychological association that you are now dependent upon a system outside of your own uh, socio-political economic system. Uh, has, uh, can you speak to that at all? Yeah, definitely. In fact, uh, I'm also a member of what we founded two, two or three years ago called the Dollarization Observatory, uh -huh. uh, which analyzes the, the issues around dollarizations. And one of the uh, elements that we analyze is the cultural and semiotic dimension mm -hmm. of dollarization. Because, um, you know, usually uh, uh, every country has their own currency with the national heroes mm -hmm. on, the, on the bills. And then now we have, you know, Hamilton or Andrew Jackson, or uh, if you're lucky, Benjamin Franklin in, <laughs> on, in your bills. Uh, and uh, we, we uh, just recently, because of the 20th anniversary of dollarization, uh, we wrote up a piece uh, together with all my colleagues on the cultural dimensions of, mm -hmm. of dollarization. And of course, uh, as you might uh, understand, and what might come out, come out uh, fairly obviously, is that, of course, uh, there's a total loss of identity in terms mm -hmm. of uh, using someone else's uh, currency. 
Uh, there's also a, an importation of what we call cultura americana in the sense that uh, not only is the actual paper bills that we're using, but mm. we adopt many of the cultural practices yes. uh, of the U.S. culture. Uh, and also uh, several uh, discussions about what we call the uh, a, a, a term by Ernesto Laclau called the uh, empty significant, which is basically anybody can fill with meaning uh, what dolarization means. Uh -huh. uh, so you, whatever, I mean, some people think, oh, it's good, it's bad, it's, mm. it's, it's, you, you feel, anybody can fill it with any meaning because it doesn't really mean anything anyway. It's well, and I would imagine that that, the cost of that is most prevalent in a culture like yours, which does have a strong tradition of wisdom and this, uh, uh, indigenous kind of um, passing down of the ancestors' knowledge and meaning that come that gets imbued within that. I would imagine that the uh, dealing, you know, having this empty vessel of America is um, the most challenge. Is that that becomes most obvious when you're used to having such a rich culture and heritage? Yeah, I mean, uh, look, the the. The trauma of the hyperinflation of the 90s also has time effects in the sense that perhaps that generation, because of the economic sense, because of the economic experience, are not willing to go back to a domestic currency in mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. But their children and their ch children's children are definitely questioning the fact that when they wake up and they go to school they have to use these paper bills that are not even in their own language and don't have uh, the national identity incorporated there and uh, there is a discussion already especially among the youngest generation uh, about the cultural and identity implications mm -hmm. of currency uh, but yeah that's uh, an entire uh, aspect that uh, definitely has been under studied under discussed mm -hmm. in, in the Ecuadorian society so, I, well, I appreciate you educating me on that. And so when we do come on to the ideas of decolonization and, and uh, de-dollarizing and decolonizing uh, currency, uh, obviously you've got a rich heritage in sort of un understanding what that would mean and what the effects of the, uh, the reverse are. But let's start with SDRs because this is the thing that stuck out to me. I thought, I had heard of the IMF. I thought the IMF was a... Uh, a governance body that was there to basically just tell, I mean, as a, as a layman, not knowing anything, I thought they were just there to tell countries off if they did bad things with, you know, with their practice of their money. I didn't realize that they have as much power as they have to issue um, what seems to me to be money, but in sheep's clothing. And I wonder whether you could explain what to us what SDRs are, and then we could discuss about their importance, shall we say, in the global stage. Yeah, definitely. Okay, we can uh, move on to that. So, uh, first, uh, it's very important to know that uh, SDRs are almost secretive in yeah. the sense that uh, a lot of people even find a conspiracy in, uh, in the existence of, of SDRs. Uh, but yeah, even among economists, even about finance people, uh, SDRs are sort of a mystery. And I could, I'm pretty confident when I when I say that nine out of ten economists, not even to mention lay people, <laughs> uh, don't know what SDRs are or their functions or how, or how it works. So it, it is definitely uh, almost a mystery in that sense that we have to try to unravel it, make knowledge about SDRs more democratic. Uh, but yeah. Uh, the IMF, as, as you say, uh, it's basically that that's the function of the IMF to call out uh, countries on their uh, economics, on their uh, political economy issues, uh, but mainly and in, in throughout history and especially throughout recent history on behalf of uh, creditors. So mm -hmm. basically uh, financial capital. And by that, I mean banks and bankers and investment funds and mm -hmm. those who are on the creditor side of the economy, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, so basically when they go and intervene in, in a country and they say, uh, you've been managing your economic policy in the wrong manner, 
now you have to you know lower salaries so that you're more competitive and you can export more and that way you can have more currency and with that currency you can pay back uh, your loans and uh, that's basically what the IMF has been doing uh, for perhaps three or four decades now okay and I'm, am I right in thinking that the amount of um, loans um, which don't seem to get paid back but the amount of loans I think in the form of SDRs amount to about 200 billion um, at the moment is would that sound right yeah, the, the uh, IMF uh, portfolio, as it is called, uh, right now it's about 200 to 150 billion dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, most of it, or uh, not most of it, but the largest loan right now is to Argentina, which was uh, for almost 50 billion dollars worth of, of loans in the last few years. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are other loans that are simultaneously taking place in countries in Latin America and Africa and some in Asia uh, as well. But uh, the IMF, besides this lending function, has a, an, another function that is little known, which is called uh, the SDR issuance mm -hmm. uh, function. And uh, this SDR uh, issuance and allocation function is, uh, uh, it was incorporated into the IMF in the late 60s Mm -hmm. When the gold standard uh, was broken, the gold dollar standard was broken yes. in the Nixon administration uh, in the United States. And in 1969, for the first time uh, in the world, uh, the world, the countries represented at the United Nations and therefore represented at the IMF, decided to issue this sort of global currency, this global mm -hmm. money, this international money called the special drawing right. Mm -hmm. Now, the special drawing right is tied to a basket of international currencies such as the US dollar, the pound sterling, uh, the Japanese yen, the euro, and most recently the Chinese uh, renminbi, the yuan renminbi. So uh, the value of the SDR is defined on a weight, weight average, a weighted average of these five uh, international, internationally used uh, currencies. And basically, uh, only central banks can use SDRs. It's not mm -hmm. something that we can all put in our pockets. Only central banks can use SDRs. And basically, it's used uh, for transfers among central banks. So mm -hmm. one central bank from Mongolia can transfer SDRs to one in India, and, and one in China, with one in Venezuela, and so mm -hmm. forth. Okay? It's not a basically, currency that's just used by people. But just to clarify, you know, we have individuals who bank in their high street and their, their, their bank, like let's say in the UK, Barclays, is then banked by the central bank of the Bank of England. Yes. And you're saying that the IMF's SDRs are basically the bank for central banks, for the Bank of England, which then in turn banks for Barclays and in turn banks for the individual. Most definitely, yeah, you yeah. Okay. explained it really well. In fact, uh, what you just described, it's called the hierarchy of money. Okay. Uh, and it's a very important concept to understand the, the plumbing of the international monetary system. Mm -hmm. And it's exactly that, that, uh, you know, the, 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 mo the world of money does not end just in your personal relationship with your private bank. Yes. But that there is a, a corresponding relationship which is a hierarchical and in the pyramid mm -hmm. uh, that uh, reaches the top uh, at the uh, SDRs, uh, but also uh, there's a parallel pyramid that flows to the Federal Reserve of the United States in the mm -hmm. sense that, uh, for example, the European Central Bank mm -hmm. uh, right now has signed a swap line agreement for access to US dollars mm -hmm. because in crisis situations like the one where, where we are living now, People don't want pounds or euros or yen or they just want dollars. Okay, yeah, and yeah. And that puts the US dollar at the top of the international uh, hierarchy. Can I just check a, a 30 second history of modern history of money with you and see if you think I've, I've got a summary in the right way? That in all of history, up until around about, I think, nine, until the Bretton Woods Agreement in 1944, we either bartered with each other and exchanged a chicken for a goat or something similar or other natural resources, 
or we used gold as a standard to exchange with each other. And then I believe that at, at this UN type meeting in 1944, they agreed to um, start loosening the, uh, that, that relationship with the gold exchange and, and prioritize the dollar as the main method of the, the as you're saying now almost the um it's all well the dollarization the using the dollar as the as the backbone of the global economy but still using gold as a, a in there until when you're mentioning in 1969 i think in 71 it was i saw a 71 somewhere so and then by 71 it was completely the gold was completely out of the equation does that sound roughly right or or have i misunderstood yeah, yeah, that's uh, mostly right, except perhaps uh, a chapter uh, that you missed, which was uh, between the 1930s and 1944, where there was also some uh, flexibility uh, as to not directly linking to the uh, to gold standard, but because of the war efforts, there was a huge increase in printing of, of money to finance the war efforts, including in the, in the UK. And uh, the pound sterling, which was the main currency of reference uh, mm -hmm. around the globe uh, at the time, uh, also relaxed its convertibility to the to gold. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, at that point, uh, in 1931, it's a famous case. Uh, the the Bank of England uh, got to keep the gold that was deposited by many countries mm. uh, at the Bank of England, and said, "Well, you can keep these little." Uh, bills with the uh, with the Queen's face, face of the queen or the king yeah. at the, and uh, <laughs> and people said but i want my gold back yeah. and I said no no so which is basically the same as what, what nixon did in 1971 yeah. yeah and they got away with it and people had and they it. because they were the big guy in the playground yeah i mean only only france in in the late 60s uh, got to reclaim their physical gold Mm -hmm. But the rest of the planet said, fine, the U.S. can keep the gold, I can, mm -hmm. I can get the greenbacks. Okay. So it, is it fair to say then that S, um, SDR, special drawing rights from the IMF, are kind of like money, but only between that global bank and central banks around the world? Yes, yes, yes. It is fair to say that. And very, very important to add to that. It is, if you want, or if you may, political money in the mm -hmm. sense that it's money that is created with a political decision by the countries that are represented on the table uh, at the IMF. They say, how much do we want to create? Uh, you know, a trillion? Okay, we created a trillion. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's uh, at the core of how uh, money functions in the sense of uh, it's institutions that create money. It's not tied to uh, a specific uh, commodity, for example. And, and just one more question on that before we move on. Let's say we had $100 and that $100 was gold back. There was $100 worth of gold in the safe. But then we wanted to create more money. Um, so let's say we had 100 $1 bills and we wanted to create another 100 $1 bills, but we still only have $100 in the, in the safe, right? That, that would be called, I believe, quantitative easing, where you print more money um, than, than you had in the supply. So kind of everyone's if dollar that they were holding is kind of worth less because there's more available. But um, is that, and is that, would that be right to call that quantitative easing? Uh, I think a broader term would be just uh, plain old money creation via uh, credit creation. So okay. this is something that banks do every day. Mm -hmm. They only have so much uh, money in their, uh, their own physical money in, at, in their store in the mm -hmm. security boxes, right? But every time they give out a loan, they don't literally give you their physical money. They first credit that loan into your bank account. Mm -hmm. So they create the money uh, at your bank account. And then, of course, if you want to, you can withdraw all that uh, physical money uh, that is represented at, at your bank account. But not all people withdraw all the money at, at the same time. So uh, that process where uh, people decide to keep most of their money deposited at the bank, 
allows the bank to have what's called a mismatch mm -hmm. between the physical reserves uh, and the money that's circulating yeah. on its books. And it's the same way uh, that quantitative easing uh, works, especially in, in developing countries, yeah. where you have some uh, reserves at the central bank, but central banks can issue more domestic money uh, as long as that money circulates within the system. Right? But the, con the concern I have, and maybe you can tell me whether this is warranted or not warranted, is that one, if this is the quality of your money here and you print some more and maybe reduce the quality of or, or, the, or the value of it, it's almost like it seems to me that printing SDRs on the other side, on the central bank side that we don't see as the average citizen, also eats into the quality of the money from the other side as well. And if I worry that essentially there's more easing or more money printing going on than we realize. And therefore it makes me ask the question, if the uh, IMF prints a bunch of SDRs to help us globally through this challenging time, whether there will be any integrity or character left in any of the major currencies that uphold the current global economic system. And I wonder if I'm being over the top here with that or or whether because it seems that it might if they were to print it might be in the trillions not in the billions they might print three trillion or five trillion to help with the scale of the economic um support that's currently in place and i, I guess I'm, I'm asking have i added this up wrong should i be less concerned or or is it eating away at the very character of the money from the other side that we just didn't know about yeah, no, I don't think that's something to be worried uh, about at this point in, in time, mm -hmm. because uh, I, I'll give you a, a very a brief example. Uh, and let's just say that if I was the central bank of any country and I printed a bunch of money and I gave it to you, but you decided to put all that money under your mattress, mm -hmm. that will have no implication for the economy, right? Yeah. Nothing will happen. There, yeah. there won't be any inflation. The value of that will, will not matter and so on. Only if you start to aggressively sort of dump that money uh, around the, the economy and while, the econ while that money is growing at a faster rate than the real production uh, rates or the real consumption rates of, of the economy, well, then it should be worried about the, the quality of money in the sense of, of inflation. Mm -hmm. But right now, that's not the worry. And that was not the worry uh, in 2009 either mm -hmm. when uh, the IMF issued uh, hundreds of billions of, of dollars. And there was never that inflation, either in terms of SDRs or in terms of the international currencies. Yes. You have to understand that the value uh, the currency, money, is a social institution, mm -hmm. right? It, it, it does not come from, from nature. Uh, mm -hmm. The currency is a human created institution. Therefore, uh, its value is, is socially defined. It's defined by uh, institution, by politics, by uh, violence, by force, and so on, and not so much as to the relationship between that and one or other type of commodity. Okay, okay. So what in, in our current climate then, in the position we find ourselves in now, where governments are putting unprecedented support out there and we are having a grinding halt to conventional economic activity. Are, I mean, are SDRs a significant uh, part of this equation? And, um, you know, and is it something that we should be keeping our eye on to see what the IMF does? Um, or is there something else we should be paying attention to at this time? Okay, so I guess to respond to that, uh, I have to divide the world into two. Uh, what you may call the C6 countries, and this is a term that will come out more in the future, so it's good to know. The C6, you know, you've heard of the G20, the G7, yes. and so forth. Now, the key countries are what's called the C6 countries, which are the central bank, the six central banks of the world. That Euro, have dollar, England. Right. So the US, uh, Euro, uh, the Bank of England the Bank of Japan and the Bank of the National Bank of Switzerland. The Swiss okay. National Bank, okay? Uh, 
these these six uh, central banks and the Japanese central banks, so the Bank of Japan. Sorry. Okay. So these six central banks have statutory infinite dollar privilege in the sense that they can call up the United States uh, Federal mm -hmm. Reserve. And if they run out of money, the United States government through the Federal Reserve has promised that they have an infinite bank account at the Federal Reserve, okay? So these wow. other five central banks have access to the central bank, which is the Federal Reserve, in such a sense that if they run out of money, they can ask for infinite amount of dollars from the Federal Reserve. And the Federal Reserve said, yes, you can access this infinite amount of dollars. So that the privilege that the US dollar has in terms of quantitative easing has now been extended to these other five partners in an unlimited fashion. Uh, and it has a limited extension for nine other central banks, which are basically the Scandinavian countries, Australia, New mm. Zealand, Korea, Mexico, and Brazil. Mm. But the rest of the world, which is 83% of the population of the planet, so more than 6 billion people, do not have the infinite dollar privilege. Mm. So that's when the SDRs come in. Mm. And because this part of the world has the infinite dollar privilege, what is there for the rest of the planet? What is there for a country like my own, like yeah. Ecuador? What is there for Angola or for Togo or for uh, Myanmar or Cambodia, right? They don't have this uh, dollar privilege. So what we need for them is this, this global money, the alternative to the dollar that can help them finance the fight against uh, the coronavirus, the pandemic, the economic paralyzation, in at least in a comparative magnitude and in a size that's almost equal to the <laughs> infinite uh, dollar provision that the Fed has given to these privileged uh, countries through their central banks. Right? So that's why we need wow. uh, the SDR issuance. And the only way to do it right now is via the uh, IMF. It'd be better if there was some other governance available uh, to issue this money. But for now, the money that is available uh, is the SDRs issued by the IMF. Mm -hmm. uh, and that would give basically a, a large amount of money mm -hmm. to developing countries that do not have the dollar access uh, so that they can uh, finance uh, importation of medical equipment, uh, importation of uh, basically medical goods, in some cases even food, because uh, the economic paralysis has meant that there is not enough supply of food for, mm. for population, mm. uh, and also uh, to finance uh, other needs uh, such as the uh, very important uh, strengthening of their own currencies mm. so that they can give basically money to people that, so mm. they can survive. You have to understand in the developing world, more than half of the adult population does not have a formal job. Mm. They work on a day-to-day, -day, basically mm. either selling something on the street or have a very small shop where they sell uh, goods uh, or they produce things in the countryside that they have to sell day by day. Uh, and that means that they don't have social security. They don't have a social safety net. And it means that governments have to fill in uh, the, impos the impossibility of them going to the streets day-to-day -day and giving them money in their pockets mm or as we may talk about later, in their cell phones. Okay, so okay, so take Ecuador as the example then. You're on the dollar currency anyway. You, you, if you run out of money, you'll go to the US and say, can we have some more money? And they might say no, in which case you go to the IMF and you say, can we have some SDRs please? And they will say, okay, here's 100, here's here's uh, 10 billion of SDRs, and then you go back to the US with your SDR and say, can you give us some more dollars and we'll transfer you our SDR? Yeah, so right now that's, that's how it's working. In fact, that's exactly what's been happening. The uh, Ecuador has run out of, of money. What? And it has in gone to the- In the current, uh, with the current issues? Yeah, with the current issues, because Ecuador is an oil exporter mm. and the oil has now gone to the, the floor it's uh, quoting at less than 20 in, in Ecuadorian oil is quoting at less than 20 dollars a barrel 
Uh, so Ecuador doesn't have money right now. It has gone to uh, banks, to Wall Street, and said, hey, uh, give us more money. And of course, that's not going to happen. Uh, so they have asked the IMF for a loan. IMF has also said, no, you're not getting a loan. So mm -hmm. the only possibility right now is for the world to decide to issue these SDRs. Now, it's important to understand that it's not a country by country issuance, mm -hmm. the universal issuance, a decision that's taken at the same point in time and the, same, and the money is spread out around uh, all of the countries in the world at the same time. So it's okay. not discretional in the sense that the IMF decides how many to issue for each country. It's what, a, is it based on population or economy size or something? Or? It's, uh, it's based actually on the voting power at the IMF which is in itself roughly based on the size of the economy, but with a larger representation uh, for uh, the, the countries in Europe and the United States. In fact, the United States has veto power uh, at the IMF uh, in the sense that uh, no, no major decision can be taken without the uh, United States uh, vote. Mm. Is it fair? So decisions have to be taken with an 85% majority and the United States has 17%. So if you do the relationship there, no decision basically can be taken without the United States vote. I, I don't think it's fair. It does not represent the situation mm -hmm. uh, of the world economy today. Perhaps that is what was represented in 1944, but it definitely gives the United States uh, not only the dollar privilege, but also a political privilege of deciding what happens with the rest of the world. Mm. And you, you mentioned something earlier about, you look, money is not rooted in the natural world, but, but it used to be, you know, it used to be about gold and, and it used to be about value exchange in goods and then by proxy with gold. And then, and then now I, is it, I mean, I think it, it seems to me that the modern era of the dollar is really rooted in, in oil as the natural resource and and the it seems to me like i was looking the other day at countries with debt and countries who have got money and it seems like only china who have been selling us all of our stuff and the saudis and norway see with the oil seem to be the only ones with money and it seems like no one else has any money um even the us is is like incredibly in debt it's, it, and, and I might be looking at this too crudely, so please educate me, but it seems like the US was very powerful economically and managed to get everyone to trade the natural resource of the industrialized era of oil through the dollar, like made themselves central and managed to do away with the, the gold standard so they had more flexibility. Um, then also managed to get in a strong position in the global stage with the IMF and voting rights that mean that nothing passes without their say so. But when I actually think about what their economy is today, I don't understand why they're so powerful if I look at it today, because actually China's economy or even, I mean, Norway are really small, obviously, like a few million people, but they have loads of money in the bank. And I, I guess my, my question is, you know, I mean, is money, can we survive with money being so devoid from the natural resources? Can it carry on like that? And, and do, you, do you sort of see what I'm saying about America's position that maybe it's getting more and more tenuous or am I missing something about how the equation works? Okay, so there are a bunch of uh, questions uh, in there, but uh, let's start with the fact that uh, with, with the United States huge debt to the world basically, okay? So uh, if you see it from a currency perspective, uh, it is basically the best of all worlds in the sense that, you know, you print these dollar bills and with these dollar bills, you can acquire real assets such as oil, mm -hmm. such as uh, equipment, such as technology and so on. And all you had to do was basically uh, fill out a piece of paper that says, I owe you a dollar. Yeah, or they live in the dream. Right, so in the sense of debt, uh, that's actually a, a privilege for mm -hmm. the United States mm -hmm. uh, and not a weakness. The fact that we all use the IOUs of that uh, country uh, makes that country more powerful, not less powerful, in the sense of acquiring real assets. Now, that has implications 
for climate uh, and, the, and the planetary uh, carbon economy that we live in right now. Because uh, before, or any other country basically in the world that requires oil, first has to sell bananas mm -hmm. to get the IOUs, can't print them. And to sell bananas, you have to exploit workers, you have to exploit nature, you have to devoid nature of the biophysical properties that are on the soil to ship that elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And then in exchange for that, you can buy uh, physical oil, okay? Mm -hmm. So what, what is, what is the, the printing of the United States IOUs causing to the planet that basically the U.S. is living beyond its real sector needs, beyond its real uh, capacity because they can print uh, the money. And that's what I was referring at the DECO talk to the uh, de-dollarization of petrol, or you can call it the de-dollarization of carbon because the, there is an extra demand, uh, uh, an extra planetary demand of oil because it can be financed with uh, money that's being printed and not with the exchange of natural resources. Mm. And that's, that's what the, perhaps not specifically at this second facing the coronavirus pandemic, but as soon as we come out of this, this is a huge lesson that has to be learned in the sense that uh, the next emergency that we're going to have to face is a climate emergency. Mm. And if we don't explore the monetary properties of the climate emergency, uh, we might as well not do anything because it, it, it will continue to be uh, replicated. Okay. I mean, can you imagine if all of a sudden uh, Ecuador uh, or, I don't know, Brazil had an agreement with the Saudis and, and they said, now oil is only going to be sold in Brazilian money, in Brazilian mm -hmm. reals. I mean, of course, the Brazilian economy is going to boom because they can just print Brazilian reals and get, and get uh, uh, oil and get energy and, and, the, and the consumption uh, of that economy will be huge and the emissions and the carbon yeah. consumption of the economy will be huge as well. So we have to understand those dynamics as well. I think, I think that's what I mean, though. I may not have said it, but I think what I'm saying is, isn't... The, the, as you say, the privilege that America enjoys is that they can print the IOUs that means that they can get the oil, which means they can develop quick. So if you took that privilege away from them, um, that would all change for America, wouldn't it? That would, it would reveal that they're maybe not in the position that maybe they were 30 years ago. Um, and that may not be right. I'm keen to hear what you're thinking, but or, or at least have overextended themselves. Well, the thing is that that privilege did not come out of uh, goodwill or you know just uh, uh, sort of niceties <laughs> or, or argumentative uh, capacity. Yeah. That privilege came out out of a military pact uh, mm. at the same time that you mentioned Nixon administration in 1971 decided to uh, break the linkage between uh, the US dollar and gold, mm. and they decided to create this new link with linkage, uh, but based on a military agreement with the monarchies of the uh, Persian Gulf, mm. of, uh, where they said, okay, uh, we'll give you military protection uh, as long as uh, oil is quoted in, in US dollars. Mm. And uh, whoever has tried to challenge mm -hmm. the military dimension, the, the physical violence dimension of the dollar hegemony in the oil and, in the, and other energy markets uh, has faced uh, invasions. Mm -hmm. And the, the most clear cut case that has been widely documented is the case of 2003 uh, with Iraq. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have to remember when Saddam Hussein said that he was now going to sell his oil, the Iraqi oil in euros, Mm. And if you remember, France and Germany opposed the Iraq war, right? Mm. Because then your, the European Central Bank, by printing euros, would get access to real resources. Mm. And the United States said, no, 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 I can't tolerate this. And of course, pursued the, the Iraq the war in Iraq with uh, the maintenance of dollar mm. hegemony in the oil markets. Mm. You can think of other experiences like... Uh, Libya and right now in Venezuela and other countries as well, 
but it's uh, most of the reasons why uh, the a change in in the policy to quote oil and uh, money different than the U.S. dollar will be facing uh, what's called currency coercion, which mm. is also a concept that has been uh, studied among historians mm. for the last uh, sixty hundred years. So actually, the relationship between the dominant money and nature is extremely important to the point where they will militarize it. And if you try to object at that, then you'll be subject to military action. That's kind of what experience tells us, no? Yeah. In fact, um, the, the use of, of money in, in any sphere is ultimately derived from the capacity to exert a violence in mm. that sphere. Mm -hmm. And that's what the currency coercion literature explains, you know, if it was not oil at the time, but if it was just a king mm -hmm. that wanted to say, you know, this is the currency of, of my feud, uh, then uh, he exerted that with violence and people started to use that currency. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a violence, pol violence uh, constituted political institution. Mm -hmm. That's what uh, money is. So, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't exactly link it to, to nature, but uh, more to the institutional violence element, which mm. then links it to, to nature. Okay. But the link is not direct. Understood. So to finish the dollarization part of the conversation, mm -hmm. if we were, through some magic of political will, to de-dollarize, um, well, sorry, we're not talking about, in your talk, were you, I've, I've confused myself now between the dollarization of, of nations like Ecuador and the dollarization of oil being the, the right. price. What is it that you're primarily calling for? I'm calling for the de dollarization of oil. Yes. Uh, because that's the global implications. Yes. You know, <laughs> unfortunately, a country like mine is fairly, uh, you know, minuscule related to the global sphere. Uh, but but it, what it does it bring about is the experience of how the money works. Well, it, indeed. So let's say we did manage through an act of a miraculous political will, de-dollarize oil. What would you have oil quantified in? Well, it can be quantified in the domestic currencies of the oil exporters, for example. Right? Ah, okay. Or it could be quantified in a common global currency like the SDR. Or it could be quantified in regional currencies, like uh, Gaddafi proposed for Africa. Mm. Uh, let's sell African oils in the African dinar. Mm -hmm. And that way, uh, it is the rest of the world that has to acquire African dinners to, to then buy African oil. Mm -hmm. So that, what does that create? It creates a demand for African goods. Mm -hmm. uh, and, it, and it gives, obviously, more power to African nations. So there are many alternatives to a, an alternative design that does not go through the, through the U.S. dollar, mm -hmm. uh, through this hierarchy that we discussed earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I mean, there are many ways of, of doing this. But essentially, uh, you, would be, you would be happy or prefer an idea that either um, decentralizes the currency or sends it to a genuinely global currency but not prioritizes one nation's currency as the enforced route by which we have to trade in the commodity yeah definitely i mean we need either a like you said distributed or decentralized mm -hmm. mechanism to sell uh, this like we do in real life more for more most goods yeah or uh, a global agreement on on this that would take away the privilege of one country but Right. This is uh, not something simple to do. It no. uh, does but, not happen without uh, basically global revolution. <laughs> indeed. But so is, am I right then to think that when you talk about the decolonization and the de-dollarization, that almost those two things are, are one and the same? Because if we were to de-dollarize, are you talking about the colonization of America because it is the um, dollarizing the oil? Right. What I'm referring to when I say to the decolonization of, of money, I'm basically referring to the hegemonic characteristics of the dollar mm -hmm. on the rest of uh, basically the developing world. Yes. One characteristic, for example, is what I mentioned earlier. The fact that the infinite dollar axis has only been uh, shared with five other central banks of the planet 
but the rest of the developing world does not have that access. For me, that mm -hmm. is clearly a colonial uh, design mm -hmm. of monetary policy mm -hmm. that, it, like I wrote another a article that you can find uh, online in, uh, in the nation, it's called Against Monetary Triage. And what I refer uh, by that term is, you know how we see, for example, in Italy, there are not enough uh, intensive care units and doctors yeah. are having to decide who lives and who dies. Yeah. And the same thing is happening right now in the monetary dimension. Uh -huh. The United States uh, Federal Reserve decides who gets the lifeline to the dollars mm -hmm. and who doesn't. Mm -hmm. And the implications of that on the real side of things mm -hmm. is who gets to import medical equipment and who doesn't. Therefore, what's happening is basically a global monetary triage mm -hmm. at a very large scale that is affecting billions of people around the planet. Mm -hmm. So for me, that is a colonial uh, design and structure of money uh, today. Well, I totally agree. And I, and I think people underestimate the cultural power as well, as you said, of having these certain characters and heroes on the notes that you're forced then to trade with. I think that on a deep uh, psychological level as well as a, as a resource and natural resource level, I think it has a, a very deep impact on, on, uh, on individual nations around the world. So to bring it back then to, to Ecuador, where we are here current day, if you had all of the political will you needed and all of the access and, and power, what, would, what do you wish for, uh, and, and let me add one more layer, not just in the context of corona, but in the context of this uh, decade of ecological crisis where we have to crack our carbon budget and get to a net zero or net negative position to start uh, to slow down the, uh, the climate change. If given that um, Ecuador is an oil based economy, as you said, there must be a pull in two directions for you where on one side you you want um, the de-dollarization of oil so that you would have a fairer access to the market and, and less hegemony or control from the US. But on the other hand, you must be getting pulled in the direction of, of wondering what, what other resources or, or what could, um, you know, how does that look in the light of the ecological crisis we have extracting uh, more m more fossil fuels as the core part of your economy. I mean, is there an evolution there for Ecuador? Right, yeah. I mean, what I would do and uh, what uh, we tried to do when we were there with the Correa government was to transform uh, the logic of the economy, right? From uh, coming from what's called an exchange value of the natural resources. So I don't know, not thinking of bananas in terms of how many dollars that may come in in foreign exchange or not thinking in terms of barrels of oil in terms of how many dollars that will represent to us, but rather in terms of the use value, right? Mm. So in terms of how those barrels of oil may become plastic uh, that, and the plastic will be used so that the sewage treatment plants have enough uh, uh, tubes and have enough uh, structure so that people can have access to drinking water so that people can have access to textiles, so that there are enough uh, fertilizer for uh, plants so that there can be food for the people. So our, the challenge really is to think uh, of natural resources, not so much in how much I can uh, sell these for yes. in, the, in the global planetary market, but how much uh, I can use them for uh, basically satisfying human needs Mm -hmm. or for what our constitutional paradigm is called buen vivir, which in English translates to uh, full life or good life, mm -hmm. uh, in the sense that that's what we have to prioritize. Now, mm -hmm. when you start to focus on the use value of the natural resources, obviously the rate of extraction goes much lower mm -hmm. because exchange value is uh, faced with planetary demand so there will ne never be enough uh, oil in the market for the entire planet yes. but when you start thinking about the use value you say wait why am i extracting all these barrels of oil for the uh, exporting market i need to keep some for my own petrochemical industry for my fertilizers mm -hmm. so that i can have my own plastic so that I can have my own textiles mm. and, and so forth. It's, it's changing 
the, the dynamic of how the natural resource is actually used. Mm. So in a way, w would it be fair to say that you're advocating for a kind of a deglobalizing mindset a little bit, where you kind of ask the, the average Ecuadorian to believe in their own country, to imagine the creativity they could, that could emerge if they see these things around them as, as, as uh, ingredients that could build a wonderful life for Ecuadorians, regardless of what, uh, or less dependent at least on what everybody else is doing around the world, build a beautiful life here. Yeah, definitely. That's, uh, that's in fact what our constitution mandates. We have a new constitution that was approved in 2008 that says that uh, the job of any public servant of the entire public sector in Ecuador is the goal is to look for full life, mm. full life, buen vivir. Mm. And, and that is defined, buen vivir, as a series of human rights mm. in the sense of, you know, access to health, to education, to food, to housing, and so forth, uh, and the, in a harmony with nature in the sense mm. of uh, what we call economic stability in our constitution is actually a definition which is very different from uh, the OECD or the richer mm -hmm. countries. Economic stability in, in Ecuador, uh, according to our constitution, means uh, the fulfillment of human rights yes. in the context of the sustainable use of the biophysical resources of the country. Okay? Wow, interesting. So that's that's the, the framework in which we have to work. Mm. That we can, you know, perhaps we can all be rich tomorrow, but then we'll have no uh, 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 no nature for the next generation. Yes. Yes. So it has to be not only fulfillment of human rights, but within the restriction mm. of the biophysical resources that we have, which imply human resources, uh -huh. but also natural resources, right? And so intergenerational equality. Yeah. Well, that's, I think that's very inspiring, actually. And it reminds me when I was in Costa Rica of the slogan you hear everywhere, Pura Vida, Pura you know, vida. pure life. Yeah. You know, it's that right. same kind of zeal. Of, and, and in our much more boring language, we, we uh, well, Aristotle talked about um, eudaimonia or human flourishing. But I like the way you guys put it a lot better. But um, so, so in then, into that picture, that dream, what would be, if, again, if you had the magic wand to write a new agreement in the world on the global stage right now, what new agreement would you force the IMF or the US or the rest of the governments around the world, especially in that C6 and their outer circle around the C6, um, what, what would be the new agreement that you would hope for everybody to sign that, um, that would allow you the uh, you being ecuador the independence the ability the the the, the, rel the relative support that's required in order to be able to support that reimagination of your own identity and your own country and culture right so basically uh, what i would do in in terms of a new agreement is try to rewrite uh, the planetary agreements mm -hmm. so that we can put life at the center of mm -hmm. uh, uh, our society, our planetary mm -hmm. society, and not money, right? Okay. So money has to be subordinated to life mm -hmm. and not life subordinated to money. And How would, uh, that's you do a, that? How would that's, the agreement work that would make that happen? Well, it, 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 it requires... A, uh, a planning of the uh, economic planetary system where we put some certain public goods as a priority for the population mm -hmm. that should be excluded from the monetary and market dimensions, mm -hmm. such as those related to the fulfillment of human rights, mm -hmm. which fortunately there is already a universal declaration of human rights uh, that we can start to work with, right? So the right to life, the right to education, the right to health, and so forth. And those should be excluded from the entire, say, WTO uh, agreements, the agreements related to the functioning of the monetary system. Those have to be globally provided uh, goods that can be financed, for example, by this political money such as SDRs. Mm -hmm. uh, but then the rest, sure. I mean, I don't see why we have to regulate T-shirts or ties or... 
yeah. uh, uh, I don't know, toothpaste maybe, but uh, uh, for these essential goods for the reproduction of life in society, mm. such as the public health system, such as the clean environment, such as the decarbonization of the planet and so forth, they have to come out of the monetary and the market sphere. Mm -hmm. uh, and that can be uh, designed accordingly. I mean, we are a very intelligent uh, species. We have the capacity to do that. Mm -hmm. If we propose uh, that, that's what should be done. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there, there are ways to, to achieve that uh, mm -hmm. with the infrastructure, with uh, the organization of the monetary system, with the organization of the trade system. And in fact, this is nothing new that has been proposed uh, for decades. Mm. And I think it's time to move on and, and go in that direction. Amazing. Amazing. Well, I find it incredibly inspiring talking to you. And I feel I, I resonate greatly with the subordination of money to the end goal of supporting life. And I think that is ultimately where we get it wrong with, to be honest, any, it's my general critique of measurement. You know, whether yeah. we're talking about the measurement of education or the measurement of value or whatever it may be, it's the tail cannot wag the dog is the expression that we use. And I think so often it does. And um, it's really amazing as well to be talking with you on the other side of the world and hearing it from your perspective, somebody who's been at the front lines doing it. If you, if you have a couple of minutes, I'd love to ask you a couple of wacky questions that are just yeah. out there. Like, why not, you know? Um, and uh, if, is that all right before we come yeah. into land? Go for it. So who would win? Who would win if we, as a globe, as a planetary agreement, just decided to cancel all debt on every level of the hierarchy of money from IMF, central bank, um, Barclays, the individual on the street, who, who would win out of that if we managed, if some magic wand, I managed to get it done, all debt before 2020 gone, what, what, what would that do? do can you, can, I mean, it might be Bob, a crazy question to ask, but I just wonder because so much loans, so many loans, so many bailouts, and I just wonder what would happen if you got rid of it all. Yeah, well, that's a, that's a good question. And you know what? The, the, it's actually being discussed right now. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called a Global Jubilee. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's uh, happened in, in history uh, a bunch of times. Uh, it, it used to be a, a normal practice in uh, biblical times mm -hmm. where basically the, the rich people that were the creditors of the rest of the population, every 50 years forgave all debts and then started mm -hmm. anew so that people would not uh, become slaves, basically, mm. right? So uh, after the Second World War, there was such a jubilee also for uh, basically Europe and, and the world that many debts were, were forgiven. And now we're in that same discussion right now. There is actually, mm. uh, even in the, in the mainstream, the World Bank, uh, IMF are saying, maybe we should forgive all debts. Uh, so that we can start anew for especially the most vulnerable populations. Mm. Uh, but it, it is definitely something that would uh, temporarily benefit those that are under debt distress, right? Mm. Uh, both countries, people, companies, and so forth. But in the end, uh, sort of credit and, and, and debt is almost part of daily life yeah. Uh, in the sense that if you do me a favor, perhaps I owe you yeah, another yeah. favor. And that reciprocity uh, is built on top of several layers of complexity mm -hmm. into what we now know as the sort of financial system yeah. and so forth. But the origins are basically interpersonal relations mm -hmm. that once society grew in more complex, uh, those interpersonal relations were uh, un impersonalized. Mm -hmm. and uh, anonymized and yes. had to be written down in, in a ledger somewhere. Mm -hmm. And then you have basically what we have now. Now, uh, for a, a while, that will be a huge relief for most of the, of the population and the poorer countries and the, poor, and the smaller economies and the smaller companies. But with time, and those who have uh, more sophisticated technology, organization, most profound educational systems. Mm -hmm. And then of course, we'll have the bigger guns. Yeah. Uh, will again 
sort of start to prevail with time, but perhaps in a different cycle or, or a different speed or with less uh, inequality than we had seen in the period uh, before. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, even Jubilee is a moderate <laughs> position mm -hmm. because it does not alter, uh, it only alters the financial dimension, mm -hmm. but not the structural uh, dimension of access to uh, technology, knowledge, organization, mm -hmm. uh, even weapons. And, and Yes, I understand. It's like a symptom of the root cause and that root cause, whatever that may be, needs to be changed systemically if you are to get a different result. But it may give a bit of breathing room in the, in the oh, meantime. Oh, definitely. Oh, yeah. That's why I, t I would totally support that. I mean, breathing room of 50 years? Come on, that's plenty. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that works for me. Um, and 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 another just and this is my final question. I think I really appreciate your time and educating me and and uh, many others who listen to this. But how long? So let's say there's still some integrity in the U.S. currency and and uh, uh, and the whole current economic system on its back at the moment. How long could we be in a lockdown for and the money system? stay standing up because okay let's say we're in lockdown for three months right no economic activity a bunch of sdrs some printing countries call their bonds back in or however that works okay i can kind of see how that will work right but would it would it go on could it go on forever i mean could it last six months a year like i'm not asking will the coronavirus last that long i'm just saying how long would there be, is it inevitable that given enough time that that house of cards would fall in on itself or could it carry on? Okay, so you mentioned the house of cards, but I think uh, the best analogy is that game that I don't know if you have a, a, in, in the UK, the musical chairs. Yes, I mean, yes, yes. Okay, so the musical chairs, it's a fairly simple game that you play when you're a kid. You know, yeah. you put some music on and you have, you have eight people, but you have seven chairs. <laughs> As the music stops, uh, you know, there are only seven chairs. So right. one of the people, one of the persons is going to be kicked out of, of, of the game. And, and when you see kids playing this, it tends to get violent yeah. <laughs> pretty quickly. You start pushing each other and elbowing each other and so forth. So now what's happening is that... Uh, there are way less chairs on, on the ground, okay? Mm -hmm. So with the coronavirus, the real sector has shrank in, yeah. immediately. So if there were 10 chairs uh, for, for playing, now there are three chairs. Okay. And what the monetary system is doing right now is basically uh, adding battery to the radio so that you do not <laughs> turn the music off, okay? Very good. And, uh, you know, there will be a point in time when the battery will run out. Yeah. But for now, the music wants to keep playing so that, mm -hmm. you know, people don't have to push each other. Up. But the thing oh. is, in developing countries, we do not have infinite batteries yes. like the richer countries do. So the music is starting to be turned off mm -hmm. sooner and sooner. And you will have violence in the streets. You will have uh, people, you know, killing each other for the access to, to food and so on, because the monetary response is temporary. Uh, mm. And what we need is to actually provide the physical uh, uh, sanitary equipment, the physical uh, food for uh, mm. the entire population, uh, which is going to be uh, restricted. So we are at uh, that point in time where the music continues to be played but uh, it's not homogeneous and it's not definitely equitably distributed around the world. I guess my only request on a, a basic human person to person level now, in the way that um, we are in a global village, you and I, we are talking, having this lovely conversation just because of the internet. And I don't, I want to support through mutual symbiotic trade the um, much as the tone of this conversation is, I want to support and co-create with you and other uh, Ecuadorians. I want to be able to trade in a way that supports the vision of human flourishing or uh, full life that you're describing. 
And I guess my worry is like, or my question is, is there a way that I can engage or transfer value that doesn't go through all of this power system that we're talking about that allows me to more directly engage with, build relationship with, as you said, money is just an extension of our human relationships. Is there a way that I can cut out some of the levels of hierarchy, bureaucracy, and actually connect more directly with the producers and creators? Because I like that reimagination story and I want to feel I'm only one step away from it, not eight steps away through central banks and IMFs and all the other stuff in the middle. Yeah, I mean, uh, society has designed uh, uh, mechanisms for this. Uh, perhaps you're familiar with some of them uh, that are actually prevalent uh, around Europe, which are the local exchange trading systems. Okay. And they're basically a, an agreement between a community of people uh, where you agree on reciprocity mm -hmm. and that uh, if I owe you something and you owe something to somebody else or some other service or time, or uh, you just jot it down on a, a piece of paper that can be... Yeah, yeah. It's like when we go on a road trip, you know, you yeah. buy petrol, I buy petrol, the next guy buys petrol. Yeah. And then at the end of it, we say, well, we all bought a tank of petrol and uh, you just owe 30 quid to that guy. And that's it. Right. Out of you only you one just net it out. You net it out either at the end of the day yeah. or at the end of the trip or at the end of the week or at the end of every month and so on. Okay. So now that's the principle. Mm -hmm. And what we designed when we were in Ecuador, we designed such a thing for trade among uh, South American countries. Okay? Uh -huh. So we designed a system called, uh, I'll say it in Spanish first, Sistema Unitario de Compensación Regional, which means uh, a unitary system for regional compensation. Nice. Right? So basically, instead of going through the dollar sphere or through the U.S. banks or through the international plumbing that we've discussed uh, uh, throughout this talk, uh, we just agree uh, to write down what I owe you, what goods I sent you, we agree on a value. We jot it down. You send me stuff, we jot it down. And only at the end of every six months, we do the conversion to the monetary uh, uh, sphere and transfer the net amount, right? So it's a little the ideal bit... would be to never have the actual monetary transfer, but you know, six months in worth of trade in, in between countries is... is is a fairly good way to, to avoid this. Entire. That's very interesting. And in a way, it's a little bit like how a company relates with the government on tax. So I just look at all of my income and all of my costs, and then only once a year do I actually send my tax money to the government. I don't pay, you know, or, so corporation tax, to be clear, like, yeah. you know, a tax on profits. You know, you don't do it after every bit of profit every single time. You just do it once. Right. I, know, I know it's a bit of a tenuous link, but you see, most of the activity happens within the organizations and then every now and again you you do a, a kind of a settle let's say in dollars or in the in this case in dollars that's very interesting yeah it's okay. exactly it's called settlement uh, that's that's the term and in, 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 and so, it's a it's a very important uh, human invention yeah uh, clearing and settlement are very important human inventions and they can help, especially at these times of monetary mm. uh, dysfunctioning uh, of the world, because uh, not everybody has uh, physical dollars in their pocket, but you still have the capacity. I mean, you still have the company there, the machines are there, yeah. the nature is there. Uh, yeah. So you can sort of replace that uh, immediate role that money has uh, with the more uh, trust linkages and yeah. then uh, settle that at the end of a period. And we can do that internationally. Yeah. You know, we can have uh, consumers uh, in, in Europe with uh -huh. producers in, in Latin America uh, and then also consumers in Latin America with producers in Europe. Then we exchange ideas, recipes, but also goods and services. Uh, and then we net it out at the end of every six months or so. Yes, I want that. That's what I want. And uh, maybe we can talk more about how we can establish that in, in good and creative ways to help support each other's visions for life in our, in our respective uh, countries. Um, is there anything else that you would like to share before we head on off? Well, 
like I and like I mentioned uh, uh, throughout the the situation for the developing uh, countries right now is uh, is very tough. I mean, I can't uh, overstate how how bad it, it is. The fact that uh, the uh, U.S. Uh, central bank and the other country central banks have said, you know, we're we'll do whatever it takes. Mm -hmm. You know what that means? I mean, <laughs> if you stop and think about what they're mm -hmm. saying, you know, we'll do whatever it takes. It basically means, you know, they're printing gazillions or trillions or where the number doesn't even matter anymore. And that, that is a privilege mm -hmm. that not all of humanity has. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, amidst the coronavirus crisis, mm -hmm. if we do not fix uh, the problem for the rest of the world as well, uh, you see, the virus doesn't stop at the border. <laughs> mm -hmm. the, the virus uh, travels, the virus moves mm -hmm. on. And if, if there are, you know, mass uh, deaths in humanitarian crisis in Africa, in uh, Latin America, uh, that, that will uh, be con a continuous strain mm -hmm. on also the richer part of, of the world. Mm -hmm. So we need the, those decisions so that uh, liquidity can be provided, but also then the subsequent move, which is the actual physical goods and the sharing of technology and of capacities mm -hmm. to be able to produce these emergency goods in the developing world, mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, enough food for the developing world as well, so that we don't have these mass uh, graves that are starting to be built uh, mm -hmm. around the world. Uh, so, so this is a moment for, for life, and it's a moment to not care about, you know, how big the balance sheet is or how small it is. Uh, just, you know, give the, the means of uh, life uh, to people, uh, forgive, forgiving all the debts, but also transferring wealth and mm -hmm. transferring capacities so we can save as many lives uh, as possible, especially in the poorer parts of the world that are not getting into the news mm -hmm. because the news yeah. are saturated with our own local news. Exactly. Uh, so. So what would, uh, yeah. just, just to, wrap that up, what I would say. to wrap that up then, would the simplest way to give you the most liquidity in Ecuador, would it be for the IMF to do a bunch of SDRs that you had access to that you could get? That would be the, the, the quickest way. I mean, of course, there are other ways if just people give us money, but that, that's yeah. not so simple. That, that, that even in the, in the most simplest donation but from a government to another government, it requires parliamentary approval. Yeah, yeah. It requires, I don't know, legislature and administrative yeah, yeah. acts and bureaucracy and so forth. Well, going back to your musical chairs scenario, as you said, everybody's fighting. There's eight people and there's only three chairs right now. So the only person that probably has enough space and time to think about uh, helping you is the person who has their hand on the radio, on the music, right? And that's, you know, because yeah. everybody else is fighting for survival too. So it seems most likely from what I, the limited knowledge I have so far that the IMF would be the most likely route to get the cash and liquidity into your people's hands so that you can make the stuff you need to make and, uh, and survive over this uh, challenging time. So I, I wonder, I, I hope that that will come and come soon. And, and I guess it would be an unprecedented amount if they do do it, won't it? It would be something in the trillions, would you think? Well, uh, there are currently around three proposals in the sort of more uh, conservative proposal, which is 500 billion. Uh, it responds to U.S. legislation numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to get into that, that detail, but basically 500 billion is the most conservative one. Mm -hmm. The United Nations has called for 1 trillion. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, along with other economists, have called for 3 trillion yes. uh, SDRs, which would be around $4 trillion. Okay, uh, yeah. And uh, only about a third of that would reach uh, developing countries. So, wow. uh, I mean, even that is not enough because uh, the IMF itself, which is a fairly conservative institution, has said that the impact of the coronavirus on developing countries will be of $2.5 trillion. So even then we're short of the amount that's needed. Wow. So, I mean, if the IMF was to write the amount that, you know, to be com not comfortable, this is a very difficult time, whatever happens, right. but an appropriate amount given the scale of the issue, we could be talking about five or six trillion around the whole world in order to make sure that enough was getting covered. 
that's yeah that's the amount that uh, needs uh, to be discussed wow. yeah fascinating thank you so much um andres for making time i i really appreciate it and i hope that we can talk again um i i thank you for all the knowledge that you've given me and cultural understanding and it feels good to be connected as a, a global village in this complicated time thank you david it has been a pleasure to, to discuss this thing with you. thanks so much